Test, test. Okay. So, nanotechnology, the deaf hear, the lame walk, the blind see, and the poor have their genome read to them. And two big commands versus many small commands. So, this is a busy slide, and I'm going to spend a lot of time on this. Um, and so, so that you can, you can uh, I'll just give you an overview of the work that we're working on. Uh, this is a topic called laser-induced graphene. Most graphene, graphene is single atom thick sheets of graphite. It's grown at 1,000 degrees, say, on a copper substrate. We found out a way how to grow it at room temperature in the air using lasers. And it's a whole new area called laser-induced graphene. We first found this in, 19, in, in, in 2014. And we've published about a dozen papers. And now there's about a paper a week coming out from around the world on laser-induced graphene. It's really taking off. It'll probably be the first way that, that graphene is, is really commercialized. There's a company called Terraforma, and they have a spin-off called Aquaforma. This is a company that's starting in Israel. It's U.S. Uh, uh, um, a, a group of U U.S. investors have started this company. They're doing it in Israel in partnership with Ben Gurion University, uh, with their with their water resource center, which is really well advanced. And uh, I partnered with a with a young man down there a few years ago, and he's just been terrific. And uh, uh, this will go into the membrane filter systems because no microbes grow on this. It's really quite amazing. And we can kill microorganisms in a whole pool just by putting a small voltage across it, and it generates hydroxyl radical. We can really write graphene on any surface, and this is a piece of bread with an owl, the rice owl, drawn on it. And this is not ink dropped on the bread. This is actually converting the carbohydrate, the carbon in the bread, to graphene where the laser converts the carbon to graphene. It's not dropping down graphene oxide and, and, or any ink. This is actual conversion. This is a conversion of a coconut into a supercapacitor. So we can really make, make uh, uh, disposable devices. We can write graphene on clothing, integrate it now with clothing. Supercapacitors is turning out to be a huge platform technology. We have four worldwide patents filed on this, and, it, and it's really taking off. And so there'll be, this will be licensed to different companies per their application, but the first utilization is going to be through to, to try to de-desertification of the Israeli deserts. And so there's this desire to fulfill the scriptures to make the deserts flourish. And so through this, we think we can really keep the bioorganisms, bioorganisms from fouling, and also it's great for this distillation process for desalination. And so their first drive of this financial company is to try to, to uh, um, bring out the, the uh, uh, bring water to the deserts because the Israeli deserts will flourish if there's water brought to them. This is an area where we've learned how to make graphene nanoribbons. I'll tell you more about this, but we just split multi-wall carbon nanotubes into graphene nanoribbons. So they're about 250 microns long and about 100 nanometers wide and one nanometer thick. And this is a commercialized process. Uh, you can buy these from Sigma Aldrich, which is now uh, Millipore Sigma. And that's because it was licensed by EMD Merck, which owns uh, Sigma Aldrich. This is uh, 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 memory, computer memory, where we have silicon oxide switching. Two terminal memory rather than three terminal. This is another Israeli company. So the Israeli companies I've highlighted here, it's called Webit. It's right here in, in, in uh, uh, Herzliya. And uh, I just, just uh, uh, had a meeting with them on, on Sunday. It's going very well. They've hit the 40 nanometer uh, milestone at, and, and uh, uh, four kilobit array. And, and uh, they'll probably mark it at that point, or they may go down to a 28, 28 uh, uh, nanometer milestone. But it's a great memory. And, and uh, this company is working out very well here in Israel. We do a lot on traumatic brain injury and stroke. This was initially funded by the Department of Defense in the US. So we developed a drug that will take a brain that would normally look like this, have a large segment missing from a, from a traumatic brain injury, and have it look more like this. And, and uh, uh, this is another company that will probably start in Israel. I met with some vest investors on Sunday on this. This is, uh, uh, we work a lot with supercapacitors. This is a flexible supercapacitor that's been licensed to a a car manufacturer in the U.S. for the rapid acceleration of electric vehicles. You can just take a small battery coupled with supercapacitors, which will charge off of the battery and give you very rapid acceleration. Because what they realize is people will pay for rapid acceleration. 
Once they're on the highway, they're all going about the same speed. But they pay a lot of money to be able to get to that speed quicker than the other person. So if you just have fast acceleration, you can just have a very normal sized battery. Just use a supercapacitor for fast acceleration. <coughs> we, <turn, coughs> we found a way to convert asphalt, <coughs> the, the material that roads are made out of, to a highly porous carbon material which has 4,200 meters square per gram. Now a sheet of graphene has 2,800 meters square per gram. How do you get 4,200 meters square per gram? Because we have pores and we have these nanopores that open up and you can, you can stack molecules within them. So we can trap over 200 weight percent CO2. This is a very inexpensive material and it's reversible just based on the pressure swing uh, uh, reaction and this has been licensed by Apache which is a big US oil company for utilization on all of their, their oil, oil field platforms. We've learned how to grow graphene on copper foils uh, using any carbon material to show that you could even do it from negative value carbon material. What's a negative value carbon material? Well this is the leg of a roach. You put a leg of a roach, you heat it up to a thousand degrees on the copper foil, you get very nice graphene. And so you can, you can even from negative value Why material, you can, uh, because we wanted to show that, that we could convert anything into graphene at 1,000 degrees, Any, anything carbon to graphene. So graphene is the thermodynamically most stable material based on carbon. And so the idea is that the value in something is not based on the, on the price of the element, but on how those elements are arranged. That's what places value. So for example, if you just look at a person, the biological organism of a person, set aside the spirit, just look at the mechanical entity of a person. How much is that robot worth to you? Well, if you take that person and you cremate them, you get less than a penny of CO2 and water out once they've been cremated. What is the value when it's all in this molecular form? The elements are the same. It's just the value is in how these are arranged. <clears throat> this is uh, graphene quantum dots. This is $90,000 worth of graphene quantum dots. So the price of graphene quantum dots is a million dollars per kilogram. We learned how to make these from coal, which is $60 per ton. This has been licensed to a, a company just started here in, in, in Israel. This is uh, gone public and it, it's selling all over the world now. <clears throat> the large scale manufacturing is being done in New Jersey. Small scale is being done uh, just outside of Tel Aviv here. And uh, um, so it's really changed the cost of graphene quantum dots, which are non-toxic. These are being used heavily now for anti-counterfeiting. So if you have high-end uh, purses, high-end shoes that you have to put a little mark on it to make sure that it's the authentic uh, and not a knockoff material, you can use these graphene quantum dots which will, will fluoresce with a light pattern and you can, you can come up with light patterns and it's also moving in, into the color brighteners for clothing and for, for, uh, for, for upholstery. <clears throat> this is another company, Tubes, that, is <clears throat> that has been licensed by, this, by another group here in Israel. Uh, this makes batteries. These are really the best batteries in the world. They're lithium anode batteries. The anode has a 10x capacity, what's in your graphite lithium ion batteries right now. Then we had to build a cathode to go along with it because when we used the standard cathode, the cathode turned out it, it was uh, 35 times larger than the anode just to accommodate the anode. So now we're only about four times larger than the anode. And uh, generation one is being manufactured now in Texas and uh, it'll be 1.5x, it'll go into drone technology. Uh, there's a big demand for, for batteries for drones and then we'll probably move up to 2x in generation 2. Uh, this, is, <clears throat> this is a project where we're making nano cars. You see the four wheels here and here's the, the motor. This, the diameter here is about one and a half nanometers across which means that we can park 50,000 of these across the diameter of a human hair. <clears throat> so they're really quite small. When you shine a light on them this motor spins and as it spins around it projects the, the nano car across the surface. That motor actually spins at three million rotations per second when it's activated. So it's a very fast motor and you can actually see these moving across surfaces. But we've taken that motor more recently and we put peptide addends on it. That peptide will allow you to target a specific cell type. So then it goes on to a specific cell type then we turn on the motor and it drills through that cell 
and in one minute that cell is dead because it, you get holes drilled in it and the ionic potentials change, the cell dies. So of course we're targeting cancer. The first target is going to be pre-melanoma, which is just under the skin and uh, 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 just an application and have these drilled down because we can have these drilled down 200 microns <clears throat> and, and uh, the pre-melanoma is less than 100 microns below the skin. So that's this drilling through cells. We've developed a, a graphene oxide procedure which is used worldwide for making graphene oxide now. It's called the Improved Hummer's Method. We developed this for the oil field. This is for, for uh, uh, to prevent fluid loss when they're drilling. When you're drilling, the fluids infiltrate the pristine formation because of the high pressures. And then they have to go back through and wash out the drilling fluid to allow the oil and gas to flow through that formation. So what we do is we add graphene oxide and that will plug the holes. That's a sheet of graphene oxide that has been forced into a hole and then the ends coil up. Just like if I took a piece of paper, I cover my hand, I push down, the ends splay up. That's exactly what happened here. The ends splay up and wrap around. This has been licensed by Schlumberger, uh, a, a large oil, oil field services company. Uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is just showing the drilling through cells. This is graphene oxide and we use it now. This has been licensed by a company in the U.S. called uh, Zonko which uses this to remove radioactive elements from water. So when you do a water flood in, in, or in, uh, when you're extracting oil from the ground or when you do, do uh, uh, mining, you often come up with your uranium in the water. In the U.S., we can't just discharge that water back into the ground because it's radioactive. And, and so this can remove the radioactivity very well, even in the presence of sodium from seawater, that kind of concentration because the larger cations stay between the sheets and act as propens for it and the smaller cations come out. So that, that's a, 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 another procedure. We've also developed a complementary material which is much cheaper and that's just an oxidized coke. Uh, and so, so this, is, this is going out in the market now as well. <clears throat> so I'll show you a, a couple of uh, systems. This is one that I did with my own hands a few years ago. I heard a lot about, about um, Corrosion inhibitors, it's just corrosion was a big problem in the industry, particularly oil and gas industry, which is very big in, in Houston, where, 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 uh, uh, where I live. And so there are six steel plates here. One of them was uncoated. Four of them were coated by products that are used in the oil field industry right now. And one was coated by a material that, that I developed in the laboratory. You have to guess which one was coated by our material. <laughs> so it's called Rust Patrol. It's being sold now in the United States. The, the worldwide sales will go out soon. We also have a green version that has no VOC releasent. So this was 5% salt fog, 47 days side-by-side -side tests on 1010 carbon steel. This is an independent test. This wasn't my own test. This was an independent facility did this. That's 47 days in a 5% salt fog. We also have a heavy duty version, which was six months in a 10% salt fog. And so you see the ability of this to really prevent uh, corrosion and, uh, and it's price competitive. Uh, we have another company, this is out of San Diego called Roswell, and it's truly molecular electronics, where we're using molecular electronics to read the, whole, whole, the entire genome. The, this company that you talked about, this 23andMe, this is just telling you origins of, of, of locales, which is having a lot of trouble. I don't know if you saw some of the news on it recently. We are reading the whole human genome. We are giving the precise genome map, which in, when they, you know, the Human Genome Project uh, uh, in the 1990s it was a billion dollars to get a human genome read. Now it's a thousand dollars to get a human genome read. This we want to reduce the price to a hundred dollars one hour and then it makes it accessible to everyone in the world so that you can really begin to see the diseases that people will eventually get so that they can uh, uh, change their lifestyle in accordance. This is what the chips look like and I'll play you this little movie and this will describe I'm James it. Tour from Rice University <coughs> and I'm part of this Roswell team. I've been working in the area of molecular electronics for almost 30 years now. What molecular electronics is, is single molecules doing switching functions. And the problem that we had formerly, we never could detect the signals, they were too small. But now we can do single molecule signal detection with CMOS integration. So we've partnered with the Roswell team for delivering a $100 analysis of a human genome. It's a disruptive technology, it's low cost, it's high speed high quality for precision medicine. And so the idea is with $100 and one hour and a single chip, 
to deliver the full human genome. It's fully miniaturized. It's the smallest we'll ever get. It's already based on a single molecule. And so we can handle also the big data that comes along with this. We have the FPGAs, the GPUs, the multi-core CPUs, the high-speed data buses to be able to process all of the information to deliver the genome in one hour. Along with this, we can also do data storage for exabyte scale storage. So we have the capability we've learned as we read that DNA to also record data to be able to have large data handling systems. So what Roswell is bringing to the world is this $100 genome can be scaled very rapidly and then also can bring in the exabyte data storage. <clears throat> so this company will probably launch in about 18 months. But with this, we talk about big data. Where are you going to store all this big data? So we can store exabyte memory storage. So remember, you talk about uh, uh, kilobyte, megabyte, gigabyte. Then above there, people talk about terabyte. And then your pentabyte and exabyte. Each one of these jumps is a thousand-fold jump. Not tenfold, but a thousand-fold. A read bit rate on a 100 million sensor chip, one chip with 100 million sensors is about a gigabit per second. This is similar to magnetic tape read. In one cubic centimeter of dried DNA, we could have up to 500 exabytes of data in it. So this allows you to have a server farm in something that the area about this much, you can have an entire server farm now. So we will be able to handle very large data, just recording the data the way God does in DNA. So that, so, so, so that, that was uh, having the whole human genome read this, is, this was a, a, a process where we, we found we can really improve hearing. So cisplatin is, a, is one of the frontline cancer therapies. And 60% of pediatric patients that would be treated with this drug would have hearing loss. And in pediatric patients, hearing loss is particularly uh, uh, devastating because that's much of how they get their, their, their input. And it turns out that so on this chart, better hearing is down. So, so when you treat with cisplatin, they lose their hearing in these areas. So with better hearing down, it shows you that we can improve their hearing better than normal. Normal is zero. It turns out that if we treat these animals with PEG-HCCs, the, these carbon nanoparticles, their hearing is better than it was in the beginning. So we started seeing that, that, that the animals were responding to sounds more deeply, so we can actually bring back hearing, so that it, we see restoration of the hair cells within the ear uh, uh, through, through the PEG-HCCs. Now, <clears throat> what you see here is you see a mouse, a, a rat. We've cut the spinal cord right there at C5, at the base of the neck, totally in half. We put one drop of a 1% solution of the graphene nanoribbons, and then we fuse the spinal cord back together. The first week, the rat's brain is remapping which leg is which. So it's remapping through the, through the, the, the graphene nanoribbons that have been used to refuse the spinal cord. And so here he is after two weeks. He's walking around. He scored a, an 18 out of 21 on a mobility scale after two weeks. Totally cut in half spinal cord. And uh, so what happens with the graphene nanoribbons, they go between the scap. You take the, the spinal cord, you just open a little bit and bring it back together. That little bit of shear flow will cause the nanoribbons to orient with the flow, just like logs going down a river all orient with the flow of the river. This is after three weeks now. He's just rock and rolling. He's just ready to go. And so you, what happens then is that the neurons will generally grow from top down to, and bottom up, but they usually never collide. They just pass like ships in the night, and that's it. They'll never collide. But what this does is graphene, we had learned, formed a tremendous matrix for neuronal growth. They like to grow along it because of the conductivity. And so they start growing along these from bottom to top and from top to bottom, and now they collide because they're on the same highways. And so you put billions of nanoribbons in there in a 1% solution and one drop of it in there, and, and then uh, uh, the neurons can come together. And then we just use the, the brain. The brain is there and just remapping, just like a little kid is just moving around, no coordination. The brain is mapping everything. And after a while, they start knowing that their mouth is here, their ear is here. And, and uh, <clears throat> that's exactly what it was doing in the first week. So we just depend on the brain to remap the connections. So this is making the lame walk. So what's the source of creativity? Where does creativity come from? 
<clears throat> well, I'll tell you a little bit about my background. <clears throat> and and, uh, and I'm one, th this, is, this is a great honor for me to be able to speak at Bar Alan because this is a really unique university, not just in Israel, but, but throughout the world, to have, have a, a real research university that does real research, also have this background and be able to, to talk about religious issues. So Psalm 139, verse 12 says, Even the darkness is not dark to you, and the night is as bright as the day. Darkness and the light are alike to you. And this is my prayer. I say, Lord, darkness and light are the same to you. Lord, I can't see, but you can see. Lord, give us understanding. Lord, give us understanding. And go figure, God answers prayer. You ask him, and he answers. What's the source of creativity? Psalm 119, verse 97 through 100. I've probably spent more time meditating on this passage of Scripture than any other passage of Scripture. It says, oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Your commandments make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever mine. I have more insight than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation, and I understand more than the age because I've observed your precepts. <clears throat> it says, if I would make God's law, my meditation all day, if I would take seriously his word, what he would do for me, it says, is that he would make me wiser than my enemies, he'd, he'd give me more insight than all my teachers. And it doesn't say than all your Bible teachers, it's just teachers. All your teachers, he'd give you more insight. And then he says, you'll understand more than the age if you observe his precepts. I don't understand where other people are and that's up to them. I believe the scriptures. I believe the word of God. And I meditate on this verse. And it says, if I make the word of God my daily meditation, it doesn't say three days a week. I don't know if there's a blessing for three days a week or not. There's no promise. There is a promise. If you do this every day, something will happen. Persistence, that third one, right? You do this every day, this is what will happen. So there, there, was, a, there, was, a, uh, uh, um, there was a man named Bezalel. In Exodus 35, verse 30 through 35, it says, Then Moses said to the sons of Israel, See, the Lord has called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And he has filled him with the spirit of God and wisdom and understanding and in knowledge in all craftsmanship to make designs for working in gold and in silver and in bronze and in cutting of stone for setting and in carving of wood so as to perform in every inventive work. He has also put in his heart to teach both he and Aholiah, the son of Ashamach, of the tribe of Dan. And he has filled them with skill to perform every work of an engraver and of a designer and embroiderer in blue and in purple and in scarlet material and fine linen and of a weaver as performers of every work and makers of designs. This is superhuman. I mean, a man may know how to work in gold, but it says he, God's going to give him wisdom in gold, silver, bronze, stones, wood, embroidery, everything. God can take a man and extend him beyond just a singular area. This is what the Word of God teaches. God does this. God is the one who does this. Will we believe his word? So, so computing morality, I have insufficient knowledge of artificial intelligence and machine learning so as to speak as an authority on either of those subjects. I have insufficient knowledge on philosophy to speak with authority on the philosophy of morality. I didn't even know what I was going to discuss at a, you know, computing morality. What does that mean? I do have a technical background and experience in basic research and transitioning <clears throat> technologies to products. I've read the Bible every day of my life for 40 years. From Genesis chapter 1 to Revelation chapter 22, when I'm done, I start again. And I also read a proverb a day, according to the, the day of the month. So I'm confronted <clears throat> with my own fallenness and inclination toward immoral behavior. But the cry of my heart is to walk in a manner pleasing to God. I want to please him. How can we get a person walking in my morality? If you want to please them. I have four children. None of them have been, ever been in trouble outside our home. We've never gotten called into police station. Nothing. None of them. Because they want to please us. They want to please us. I want to please God. I don't want to disappoint him. Sure, I am fallen, but my desire is to please him. So I will take this rare liberty while speaking at a religious organization in Israel to 
to reflect and to tell you my personal story, which forever changed my desire to live a far more moral life that is pleasing to God. So what is it that takes a man, that takes a woman, and makes them want to live a moral life? In other words, it's not dictated upon us. If it's dictated upon us, we have real problems. I mean, there's this constant thing. How can I get away with it? How can I get away with it? But when we want to please God, what happens? So if you look historically, <clears throat> so here are the two most important commands. A religious scholar once asked a, a famous Jewish sage, Yeshua, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Quoting from Deuteronomy 6.5 and Leviticus 19.18, Yeshua replied, the sage replied, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and foremost commandment. That's what he said. And then he immediately said this, the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Then he went on to say, on these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. The underpinning for the whole thing, the whole law is this. You can take all these 613 commandments. The whole thing is underpinned with this. You got to love God with everything in you. And you got to love your neighbor as yourself. If you do that, that's the underpinning for the rest of it. If that's there, now you're going to be all right. Please charge. <laughs> what was that? Okay. Take it off. Yeah, that's it. So, so you, you know. Bluetooth mode. <laughs> You shall love the Lord your God. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. It relates to God. It relates to man. This is what you should do. So I'm going to just read to you a portion. I was just reading, reading this book by, by, uh, um, by Eric Metaxas, and he was talking about how there was a dramatic change in, in, in England when, when George Whitfield started preaching. But here's the story of it. It's worth dilating for a moment on George White Whitfield and the state of Christian faith in England in the middle of the 18th century. Since the time of the Puritans and the religious wars of the previous century, England had decidedly turned its back on any expression of what we might call serious Christian belief. Having led to so much division and violence, religion was now in full-scale retreat. The churches of the mid-18th century England all but abandoned orthodox historical Christianity and now preached a tepid kind of moralism that seemed to present civility and the preservation of the status quo as the summum bonum, which is the highest good in the supreme ethical system. And so, understandably, people looked less and less to the churches of the ult for the ultimate answer to their questions, and the fog of hopeless and brutal superstitious spiritualism crept over the land. The poor, as is ever the case, would suffer the most from these changes in Britain's religious atmosphere. But three young men arrived at Oxford University in the 1730s who soon changed things rather dramatically. John Wesley and his brother Charles were two of the three. They formed a small group called the Holy Club whose members prayed fervently and, and conspicuous, conspicuously. They were soon mocked as Methodists because other students thought they were too methodical about how they spent their time. George Whitefield, the, the third of the trio soon came to Oxford and joined them. After a few years, something surprising occurred. All of the trio's fussy doctrines and white-knuckled efforts to be holy and moral melted away, while Whit Whitfield came to a realization that, that would have far-reaching effects. He saw that the Bible didn't teach that we must work harder at becoming perfect and holy, but that we must instead throw ourselves on God's mercy. Moral perfection wasn't the answer. Jesus was the answer. Jesus had been morally perfect, and we weren't supposed to save ourselves. We were supposed to ask him to save us. No less than discovering electricity or splitting the atom, this theological about face was the beginning of a revolution. When Whitfield began to preach this new revelation, people came running to hear it. No one had heard anything like it, and soon thousands were coming from near and far to hear him. He was just 22 at this time. Shocking the starched theological establishment of his day, Whitfield even began preaching in open fields so that more people could hear him, and crowds approaching 30,000 would gather. The phenomenon that George Whitfield is, uh, the, that, the phenomenon that was George Whitfield is scarcely conceivable to modern minds. Lives by the thousands were changed all across England. Bitter miners wept and sang, and the nasty fishwives leapt for joy. No one had ever told these people what this man with a voice like a trumpet was telling them. 
But it was as if they were hearing something <clears throat> that they <clears throat> that they had always known was true, but had forgotten. Their previous experience with the religion was nothing like this. They had exchanged cod liver oil for sunshine and would never be the same. Whitfield touched down across England like a tornado, and what was left in his wake was unrecognizable from what had been there before. After he had thoroughly scrambled the English countryside and given hope and joy and meaning to the miserable poor who came to hear him, he hopped on board a ship like a fugitive and took his, his egregious troublemaker, troublemaking to the American colonies and then returned to England. In his lifetime, Whitfield would cross the Atlantic 13 times. That's from Eric Metaxas' book, Amazing Grace. So I want to tell you my story. I told you what happened in Whitfield's day. You want to have an effect on morality? You want to know what to do? You have to change the heart. Remember what he said. It wasn't about us changing ourselves. It was a reliance on God to do this work. I will tell you what caused me, a Jew born in New York, to make the decisions that I made. What is it that drove me to this? And what happened in my own life? I don't know all about these philosophical things and theoretical issues. I can only tell you what happened in my own life. In 1977, I went to college. And I was, I was uh, doing laundry in August of 1977. And I was speaking to a young man in the laundry room, and I knew he was on the, on the Syracuse University football team. So I said, do you want to play football when you graduate? He says, oh, no, I'm not good enough for that. I can't play pro ball. I said, well, what do you, what do you want to do? He says, well, maybe lay ministry. I said, I didn't know what lay ministry was. I said, what's that? He says, well, sort of like a missionary. I thought, missionary? This is 1977. I mean, we don't need missionaries. We've got TV. TV can go anywhere. Why do you need missionaries? He says, do you mind if I give you an illustration of the gospel? And this is exactly what he told me. And you'll see how this just pierced me because of a moral issue in my life. He says, you got two, these two cliffs. People are on one side. God is on the other. And sin separates you from God. Very simple terms he explained to me. He had me read this verse from Romans 3.23. He opened the Bible. He says, read this. It said, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And I looked at him and I said, I'm not a sinner. Now, I don't know what your background is, but in modern secular Judaism, at least in our home in New York, we didn't talk about sin. Sin was never talked about. And, and uh, uh, God was never really talked about very much. It was only in synagogue a couple of times a year. <laughs> and so I said, how could I be a sinner? I've never robbed a bank, and I've never killed anyone. How could I be a sinner? Then he had me read another verse. But I say to you that but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Bow! This hit me much worse than it would just a typical 18-year-old, and I'll tell you why. Because since the age of 14, I had been addicted to pornography. I worked in a gas station on the Hutchison River Parkway going into New York City, and, and uh, um, I told the guy I was 16, I was only 14, so I wasn't supposed to be working there, but they didn't check papers in those days. He was glad to get somebody to clean the parking lots. The businessmen, the salesmen, would throw away their magazines on the way home on Friday night. I cleaned the parking lots. I got all those magazines. And I got addicted to pornography long before the days of the Internet. I didn't think anybody knew. And I read that verse, and a man from 2,000 years before called me out. And it just hit me. Of all verses from the Bible for him to have me read, that was the first day in my life that I realized that I was a sinner. Something happened to me. And then he had me read a few more verses. This is just a couple of them. For by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. He said, I remember him drawing these arrows. He said, that people try lots of good works to get them to God. But they'll never get to God. It'll never be sufficient. God is holy. We are not. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I had never even heard this. I didn't even know there was a claim on the table. The school that I went to as an ele in elementary school, everybody was Jewish, except that was the year that they started busing in the African Americans from the projects. I thought you were e either Jewish or you were black, and that's it. I mean, th this, is, this is what a cloistered Christian com uh, uh, Jewish community that I had been in. I didn't even know there was this claim on the table. Then he described how Jesus would provide this way, that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And I thought, how can anybody believe in a physical resurrection? How can I believe this? 
and then it would get me to God. And then the night of November 7, 1977, that was the night. You know, this had happened to me in August. November 7, 1977, I was all alone in that room, room 1812 of the Lawrenson Dormitory on the Syracuse University campus. My roommate wasn't there. And I got down on my knees, and I don't know why I did that, because Jews that I knew stood when they prayed, Christians sat when they prayed. And I said, Lord, I am a sinner. Forgive me. Forgive me and come into my life. Forgive me, Lord. And all of a sudden, this peace began to fill this room. And this burden of sin that I felt I had been carrying just began to lift off. And all of a sudden, someone was in my room. And I opened my eyes to see who was in my room. And I didn't see anybody, but the presence of God had so filled my room, I just started weeping, weeping uncontrollably, which was very unusual for me. And I didn't know what to say. I didn't know what to do. I just enjoyed this presence for a while, and I didn't tell anybody. Two weeks later, the guy who had shared with me, he said, Jim, did you, did you receive Jesus in your heart? I said, you know, I think so, but I don't know. And why do you ask? He said, you haven't stopped smiling for weeks. Something happened to me on that day, and I remember asking him, I said, how can I remain close to God? He said, I've asked people who stayed close to God their whole lives. Do you read your Bible every day? And they say yes. And then I've asked other people who seem to drift away and it has no impact on their life. Do you read your Bible every day? They say no. I say, that I can do. If it's digital, you read your Bible, you stay close to God, you don't, you won't, that I can do. <clears throat> and I started a practice of reading the Bible every day, every day. And I started a practice shortly after that of reading it from beginning to end, beginning to end. And when I'm done, I start again. I'm in no hurry. I just say, Lord, speak to me in the passage that I'm in today. Speak to me. So here's a summary. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires. You see, he doesn't leave us in our immorality. He instructs us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. He draws us to these good deeds. And I'm going to leave you with this verse from Ecclesiastes chapter 12. The conclusion when all has been heard is, fear God and keep his commandments, because this applies to every person. For God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. This applies to every person. To every person, this applies to him or to her. God will bring every act to judgment. But the whole idea behind this is, you want morality, you got to get God. Trying to do this on your own is defeated. You'd be, you'd be defeated. What happened to me that night on November 7, 1977, something changed in me, and I've never been the same. That's my story. Thank you. Questions? Let us breathe first. <laughs> Questions? When do you find the best time is to read the Bible? Well, the question was, when, when do I find the best time is to read the Bible? Well, I wake up very early, and I, and I read the Bible, and I've actually tried to take the pattern of Daniel, and so I do it three times a day. Yeah. And so I've tried to mimic his, you know, we're not under a requirement to do that, but, but I've tried to follow his pattern. So I, I rise up quite early, and you know, when you have children, and I had four children, they're all grown, grown and gone now, but, but uh, I had to get up before them to make sure that I had my own, my own time with the Lord, and, and then I would, I would always bring a cup of tea to my wife and, and, and bring her her Bible, and she'd have her time, and then we'd gather as a family and do it every morning. So we would gather at 5.30 in the morning every morning and uh, do it as a family. And then, uh, um, and then I would usually break sometime around midday and go to the chapel on campus and just be able to get on my knees and spend some time with the Lord and then, and then shortly before bed. But my main reading time was in the morning. And it was much more than just a reading time. 
It was really a time of meditation because the scriptures, as I studied the scriptures, I noticed that it doesn't speak of reading the scriptures, but it speaks more often of meditating upon them, which is a slow, contemplative, pensive, and asking God to speak to me. And it, it, it's, it's really amazing what happens. I can go into those times in the morning feeling totally defeated, like, oh, how am I ever going to get all this stuff done that I need to get done during the day? And after I'm done, meditating on the scriptures and spending some time in prayer, I come out like a roaring lion. I mean, just nothing is standing in my way. Just, he just lifts me up. He speaks to me specific passages according to what I'm going to confront that day. Specific passages, it's like, wow. I mean, just speaks to me through the word of God. So I, I feel this, this tremendous oneness with God in those times. That's the time I will not sacrifice that for anything else. It is the time. That, that I know he's there. And, and, uh, um, and that's what you know, drives me to, to spend that time with him. But for me, morning works best. In, in the evening, sometimes I'm just so exhausted that, that the quality of the time is not as good. I know other people, they're better in, in evening times. But yes? based on your faith life, um, when you were more involved in the Jewish community, I don't know if your family was religious or observant or not, what did you feel was missing for you in that community? It's possible you weren't part of an observant family that, that you found um, later on. And the second question is, how do you feel that your faith epiphany of sorts um, um, influences or affects your practice of science? Yeah. Okay. So for the for the first one, I came from a, a quite quite uh, a secular Jewish home, and you're from the U.S. and 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 uh, you know many Jews can be really quite secular where there's there's no difference between them and, and non-Jews other than they say I'm Jewish, and that's all I said. I'm Jewish. Yeah. Yeah. I'm Jewish. I, I, actually, it was so secular that I was never trained against Christianity. I was never heard a negative word in my home about Jesus. So, so I didn't have that negative uh, uh, presentation to me. Uh, uh, so so that, that's what my home life was like. And so I've heard some other people comment, you know, they, that they say, you know, some people have come against them because they believe certain things. Look, I was shot from both sides. I mean, I, uh, I, so, so as, being, being a Christian who really loves the Lord, some people come against me and say, oh, he's just a dumb Christian. Well, I had gotten shot from the Jewish side, too, when I started speaking about this Jesus person. And, and I didn't even understand that I would get a reaction. I had been so untrained in, against, I'd been so untrained about anything about Jesus. When I started mentioning, I remember I walked up to my cousin and I said, you know, I think I've received Jesus. He was like, what? I didn't even understand his reaction. Now you can understand, I mean, he, and I understand now why he was so shocked. He said, you're Jewish, you know, how can this be? And, and uh, so I got, I got shot from that side, too. My faith community, there was very little. I didn't understand rabbis. To me, you know, they were walking around in, 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 the, in, the, uh, in the synagogue mumbling. And I didn't, you know, they looked like a strange lot of people to me. And I never had any of them stop to talk to me or anything like that. And I, I, I remembered even that I'd asked some questions, and I, they just blew me off. So, so. You, you know, you can see the seeds of that, and it, it, it was passed down as well. My father came to the U.S., immigrated to the U.S. at the age of 15. He went to the synagogue on Yom Kippur. He was, uh, my, both my parents are from Tehran, from Iranian Jews. He had come, at, my mother was 12, my father was 15. They had come, they weren't married, of course, at that time. And, and he had come, and he went to the synagogue on Yom Kippur, and they wouldn't let him in, in New York City. He says, I want to go in. Do you have a ticket? He says, I don't have a ticket. I'm just a student here. And they wouldn't let him in. And so he bore a resentment from that day that he never voiced it, but you could sense it. And so little things that we do, and I mean, Christians do the same thing. I mean, we hurt a lot of people by the things that we say. 
Uh, because many Jews ask me that, what is it about the community that made you had to seek out this? What I had is I had a young man opening up the Bible to me and showing me scripture after scripture. That is something I never had from my own Jewish community. I didn't even understand that Jesus was the Messiah when, on November 7th, 1977. It wasn't until long after that that this is the Messiah. This is, and I started putting the whole thing together. Most of what I understand about the, the, the Tanakh, I learned through the church. I didn't learn this as a Jew. So, so my background is not the same as, as many people, certainly in this, in this room. Uh, so the, the second question about how does my, my faith affect my science, I pray all the time. Now, I don't pray that my reactions will work for me and not for anybody else, because if people can't reproduce my chemical reactions, I'm in big trouble. <clears throat> so, so I pray that God gives me creativity. This is my daily prayer. Lord, give me creativity and give my students creativity. Because what distinguishes in my business, what distinguishes a person is not how smart you are, not how high an IQ you, are, you have, not what your vocabulary is, how grand it can be. It is how creative you are. When somebody reads one of your papers and they go, whoa, I wish I'd have thought of that. Creativity. And I see a man like Bezalel, and I see, I see that God gave that man creativity across many different areas. People say, how do you work in all these different fields? You go from electronic memory to medicine to devices. And I only shared with you half of the companies that we have. How do you do this? I have no idea. It's just that, that uh, uh, we get in, in, in working in a certain area, and I don't let anything inhibit me. I had a student walk up to me, well, I want to work on energy devices. I said, this was in 2000. 12 or 2013, I said, we don't, that feels so filled, I don't want it. No, let me do it. I said, okay, but if we get into working on energy devices, on batteries, within two years, we have to be one of the top groups in the world. Now, how can I say that? I don't know, I just said it. You know, so I put before them these challenges, and, you know, if, if you empower students, you pray for them, empower them, and, and, and uh, you know, I'm a motivational speaker, I'm going to encourage them in this, they start believing, and they do it. And all of a sudden, I, so many areas I don't even understand, but my students understand. And I just parrot what they tell me. And, and uh, uh, so this allows me to go to many areas, because I really think a PhD is not what I can teach my students. It's what they can learn and teach me. I'm going to motivate them, and I'm, and I'm there to facilitate them. And I, and, and I will say, let's innovate. What can we do? How are we, going to, how are we going to build a transistor out of laser-induced graphene on boxes flown across an assembly line really fast? Do it. Oh, it can't be done because of this, because of this. Five reasons. You can always give five reasons why something won't work. I want to know, what do we have to do to get it to work? As long as we're not violating a law of thermodynamics, we can get it to work. And so, you know, and I make these proclamations, and they happen. But I'm on my knees every morning praying that God gives us creativity. And it's in that that I really feel it gives me faith. It, it also affects how I speak to people. I live my life apologizing to people. Because if I have offended somebody, I have to go back and apologize to them. So if I've spoken harshly to somebody or done, and, and uh, um, you, you know, sometimes I, I tell my wife, I said, you know, I don't want to walk around with a sign that says, I'm sorry. Because I'm going to hurt somebody today. I know that. But God constantly reminds me, you're different. Jesus said, to whom much is given, much is expected. And so if I've said things to offend a person, if I've said things to hurt a person in my zeal and my fervor and things, if I've pushed a secretary too hard and, and, and I have to go back. The Holy Spirit touches my heart and says, you're an apology. He expects more from me. So, so it affects me in that way, how I deal with my fellow person. I tell my accountant, I say, look, if there's any question, pay, the, pay extra tax. I don't want to be deficient in taxes to the US government because God has so blessed me. And I've seen this over and over again. I've seen what happened. So when, when, I, when I came up with, uh, when computers were, were, I got my first computer. It was a Mac SE. It had one megabyte of RAM, a great computer. And then I got another computer. And I called up Microsoft. I said, can I put this software in that? No, each computer, you can only put, load it on one computer in those days. And computers didn't talk to each other, so it would never know. So I brought separate sets of software for every computer I was buying from my lab. My colleague came in. He said, what are you doing? You're crazy. I said, no, I called up the companies. They said, it's one computer. I bought them because I knew God was watching me. I knew he was watching me. 
And then what would happen is, at the end of the year, program managers in Washington would call me and they'd say, we have an extra pot of money, can you use it? I mean, God just blessed me. I, I, I thank Microsoft for being so stingy. It's brought great blessing on me. When we honor God, when we honor God and do according to his word, there is tremendous blessing. That's how it's affected my career and my life. Thank you. Thank you very much. difficulty that we have to dissect the practical world of big data and we have uh, really two style speakers. One is the first is Amit Saibas, who joined us yesterday and today.